All right, welcome everybody. San Francisco number one run deck meetup. I said number one. It's very specially big title. So <clears throat> I thought uh, since this being the first meetup, I should give a little history about run deck. And um, it seems kind of far ago, 2010. Three years, I guess, goes by fast, but um, that's really when the story of run deck began. So I don't know what was big in 2010. <laughs> For some people, maybe that was big in 2010. He was yeah, big for a little right. while, like for a month, that was pretty big. He was winning, he was by winning, he was winning here, he's winning there. But for me, <clears throat> what was big in 2010 was Farmville, Frontierville, Cityville, Castleville, <laughs> Frontierville, Petville, I think you get the idea. I was working at Zynga at this time. Actually, I was working here for about a year and a half during, during kind of the, uh, the tail end of when Farmville was huge, Frontierville was just coming out, and Cityville was the newest, greatest thing, the biggest game, actually, that Zynga had put out to date. And um, they kind of ran their company like a movie studio. There was a lot of the, these divisions were separated. They were very autonomous, and they all kind of had their own groups, their own dev guys, test guys, ops guys. They were pretty separated, and um, and really everything started from Treasureville, which I didn't find a good logo for. But Treasureville was kind of like the DNA. They took Treasureville and they stamped it out many times and turned all these other bills up, and um, and Treasureville. Not only was it the DNA of app code, PHP, Memcached, all their special sauce, MemQD, um, <clears throat> but also it inherited all the provisioning, release, deployment stuff. So if, uh, if you were Farmville, you really were inheriting the release process and deployment and provisioning tooling of, of Treasure. And they, they stamped this out. And in the beginning, it was fine. I mean, for Treasure it was probably good at the time when they created it. it uh, was based on uh, rake, uh, shell scripts, uh, right scale, uh, a little puppet, uh, some custom shell scripts, parallel SSH. And it was automated, but really what that meant was it was automated in pieces. This part was automated, that part was automated. So they could, you could say it was automated, but it wasn't automated end to end. Like you couldn't just push a button and say, I want this branch or these versions on these kinds of servers. To do all those things were separate steps. And um, besides that, they were, they were this kind of company that had separate business units for all these bills, but they also had this new middleware group, this new accounting business system group, and they were building their own services and creating their own deployment and operations practices. And there started to be conflicts, actually things this is when things kind of went wrong. Um, kind of stepping on each other. Is Puppet in convergence mode or not? Um, somebody's turning it on. It's opening up a bunch of change on people who weren't expecting it. So there was a lot of mayhem, actually. And right around this time, the company decided what they needed to do was centralize the operations. Because they knew that if they kept bringing up another bill, they'd have to hire another you know, release manager, dev you know, DevOps kind of guy. DevOps guys didn't exist in those days yet. But, you know, that kind of skill set. So they thought the thing to do would be to centralize all that. Makes sense. You know, from a, from a high-level company standpoint, that made a lot of sense. So <clears throat> that's when my part of the story came in. They, uh, they were looking for a kind of all-inclusive solution. And they, and they said, hey, control tier, that could be the solution. So they called us up. They said, can you help us with some control tier? So we went in there and uh, listened to their problem and started actually drilling into it. This is actually a, a true picture uh, from a whiteboard conversation of, uh, of one of their lead engineers explaining the process. And you can see the process over here. It says three to eight hours. This is just to cut the release. And then uh, here's the prod environment. And then for every node, there would be about three to five minutes to deploy it. But 
this was a company where every bill had thousands of nodes, so just do the math. Now they parallelized it, but <clears throat> that process was, uh, was more than a day. And for them, that was just you know, breaking their back. That, that just could not, to, to put any change out to take that long was, was just intolerable. And <clears throat> so they called us in saying this is a deployment problem. And, uh, and through, through later years after this point, I realized this, that's the canary in the coal mine. It's a deployment problem. The real problem as we looked at it was, yeah, this was a big pain. Deploying to 4,000 servers with a minimum outage is hard. And doing it across tiers is hard. But all this front end stuff turned out to be really where all the problems began. So they wanted to pick a, a branch and they needed to smoke test it in QA, and then they needed to distribute it into some repos, and then they needed to push it into some S3 buckets, and then they needed to kick off all their scripts to uh, Akamai stuff and download it to their servers and stage it and deploy it and all that stuff. All these parts were automated, if you remember that. So like this part would be a little automated, that part would be automated. Every one of these kind of lines was so-called automated, but it really never worked. And there was a few things that was uh, really hurting the business. First of all, besides the length of time, it took so many people, like all the lead engineers, the, the top guys that knew the ins and outs of the app would have to be available. And that pulls them off feature development time and they're always under these crunch, you know, to get the next version out. So that was a problem. The other thing was um, it totally uh, hit the sock. They called it the sock. You might call it a knock, but it's the same idea. And um, you know, it'd be all hands on deck. So every change was all hands on deck. It was very manual, really, at the end. And um, and so this was the deployment problem, as as they saw. So by drawing it out, this is before DTO got into value stream mapping and looking at things very analytically. But just getting people to to visualize on the whiteboard, we could see that. While the deployment problem was hard, it was all this kind of coordination of all these other steps that um, that were on the front end of it that were you know part of the overall delivery process that made this so painful. So there we were in April 2010. Now uh, what what I did is is start to think about this like you know uh, a software problem. You know how do we break this down into steps? and start to think about architectural tooling. Like I said, they wanted us to bring in control tier. Control tier was this comprehensive solution. It had modeling, it had orchestration, it had a package repository, uh, it had this modular automation framework. Um, but knowing the culture of that company, I was very concerned. I was very concerned that it wouldn't scale not just for technical performance reasons, because it's a massive scale at that time, we're talking 20, 30,000 nodes, uh, but mostly for organizational scale. How are you gonna get people to adopt that much learning curve? And also, it just didn't feel very, I'm using the word lean now, I didn't use the word lean then, I don't think, but it wasn't very lean. It wasn't, it wasn't just a simple thing. It was, you had to learn a lot to do something. So, uh, by breaking it down, into these kind of architectural components, uh, repos and build servers and system packaging. System packaging was a radical idea over there. They had a kind of proprietary TGZ custom packaging format. And, um, and I remember getting in all these kind of academic debates with people about the merits of system packaging. You can't package application code, that's insane. It could never work uh, and uh, Anyway, we took them through the, the thinking of it. Um, and then introducing this idea of a job ops console. I don't remember who it was. I think it was somebody in Mafia Wars or Poker. But they said, oh, you know what we need is the Jenkins for Ops. We need the Jenkins for Ops is what we need. And, uh, and that idea really kind of helped present it in people's minds. Like once that word kind of got through, they started to see, oh, yes, yeah, we need this kind of push button thing, but not for devs. We need that push button thing for ops. And that's really what this job and ops console thing uh, came from. And you can see here, you know, we, we talked about the process, you know, from this job and ops console, it was kind of centered here in this diagram, about all the things that needed to coordinate. So it was really, 
it was really more of a workflow conversation at the end. That's how we really started talking about it. It wasn't so much a, an automation at the box level. It was cross box, cross tool, cross process. Um, and to think about these processes in reusable chunks, that was another idea. Because we were trying to centralize ops at the same time. We were trying to get some kind of consolidated way of automating or have a strategy for doing it. So that led to the very first POC. Uh, by the way, that first stage took three weeks, three to four weeks. And by the time we kind of got some consensus around an approach, we implemented it. We actually implemented the POC in 10 days. It was pretty, and, and I thought for, for us, that was pretty amazing time frame. And we, we got the ops guys to stand up Yum repos, uh, Hudson, before it was Jenkins. Um, we defined a specification format because one of the things they really liked about control tier was specification driven, model driven. Um, so we came up with, a, with a, a YAML specification format that would define software stacks and platform stacks and, uh, and some kind of recipe layer for how you do automation. Um, we got everybody to buy into an SDLC. That was another kind of wild, crazy idea. You know, for the ops side, it was like, what? I got too much stuff to do. I don't want to check stuff in. I'm not a developer or what. And so that came into it. The other thing was they use right scale like for everything. To bring up nodes, for auto scaling, for monitoring, to just run ad hoc procedures, you name it. I mean, right scale was the silver bullet to the point of abuse. And um, but it was the thing that spun up all the nodes. So one of the, the tenants in our or what we call the loosely coupled tool chain philosophy was don't repeat yourself. If something knows the data, don't create an alternative database that has the same data. Just get it from the authority. So that kind of authoritative source of truth idea came from, from that experience too. And we, we decided that this job and ops console, since it was going to be the Jenkins for, for the ops world, needed to be driven from the authority of truth about the infrastructure. So we, we, we uh, tied into the right scale API for that. The other thing was they were using parallel SSH pretty effectively, actually. They had their own kind of tagging scheme. It was pretty custom uh, in, in how they used parallel SSH, but they liked SSH. SSH wasn't a problem. They thought, uh, you know, lowest common denominator is how right scale was going to talk to everything. So use SSH was the point. Um, <clears throat> the other thing was realizing that data comes from more than just the infrastructure. Data comes from outside sources. What builds do you have? Uh, what, what choices should a user get? How do you inject that kind of data that's not about the infrastructure into process automation? So um, that was another key point. And then of course, uh, you know, leveraging this whole system packaging idea to, uh, to deploy not just the third party packages like you'd expect, but also the app packages. And this dovetailed into the right scale provisioning. So before this happened, Imagine you would spin up a node with write scale, write scripts, with some server template. Some of it would be RPMs, and then you'd pile on all these, these TGZ files. Nobody really knew what versions were on there. So by bringing on these, uh, these RPMs into, the, into how we built the software stacks, now everybody had a single view, a single, set of, single way of managing dependencies, a single way of publishing and distributing. So and this is really the future of Rundeck. This is where Rundeck really became its own. Um, the very first, we, we uh, piloted this on uh, Treasure Bill, but the very first game that Rundeck actually managed was City Bill. And um, right after the POC, I want to say about a month or two after the POC, they said, let's go live with this on this new game, this new game, City Bill. Nobody knew how successful City, uh, City Bill would be. Um, they they pre-allocated 800 nodes, which is what they did for any game, 300, 800 nodes. You could just get 800 no matter what. They blew through 800 nodes in like the first six hours. And it got to 10,000 nodes in four weeks. That was the ramp on that game. And, uh, and scaling Rundeck through the brand new project, Rundeck, on that, um, on that um, sharp curve was uh, not easy and uh, was pretty difficult, but we deployed Cityville on Rundeck. So I became a believer in the loosely coupled tool chain after this. You know, I, 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 you know, I, as being part of the control tier project, I thought, oh, you need a top to bottom solution. You need to have all this kind of 
um, computer science uh, approach to uh, making a management system, but realizing the challenges of a company like Zynga and seeing it's not just a technical tool thing, it's an adoption thing, which means simplicity, this was really my first uh, proof uh, that convinced me that the loosely coupled tool chain really is the most powerful pattern. And I stand by that three years later. So that's, a, that's sort of the history of Rundeck. Um, this is Rundeck 1.0 that, that we're talking about. And I'll show you what, what's happened uh, recently in, in its kind of uh, journey. But the problems that you hear there, um, I, I've heard elsewhere in other kinds of companies. But I want to kind of generalize some of the other problems that I've seen uh, in talking to Rundeck users. So I'm sure everybody identifies with this. If you're in a software project, relative time given to the teams and work, right? So most of the time is taken by development. I've given too much time to testing here. This is very fantasy land. Sometimes that doesn't exist. And then there's ops, which on top of being kind of the last to uh, get the request, they're also very interrupt driven. So ops isn't just um, having to deal with all these non-functional requirements at the last moment. They have firefighting to do, they've got maintenance to do. There's all these things that are challenging their time on top of it. So in ops, you, you have the last minute to get things done, and at the same time, you're juggling all this other stuff. So you don't really have much bandwidth. That's the problem in ops, is you don't get much bandwidth. So that was, uh, I think, something that, that I've uh, heard quite a bit. The other one is, what's life before you really automate stuff? What, when, when I say automate, I mean fully automate, end to end. Um, it looks like this for a lot of people. It's a readme file, do step one, then do step two, and then go find the other readme to find out what else you gotta do, and you're dumpster diving. That's how I feel like you're, you're basically dumpster diving onto all the extra information you need to get the job done. So that's, uh, some people call that a run book. The other one is a spreadsheet, the deployment plan. The deployment plan has a spreadsheet, looks great. It's got tabs on it. There's people's names, there's tasks, there's times, there's contact info, um, deployment plan, you know, it's better than a readme that you have to dive into God knows how many folders and, and sort of build this picture in your mind of what you have to do. It's easier to quarterback <coughs> this, but it's not automated. And then there's this. This is the catch-all. Some guy is going to tell you what to do. First you do this, then you do that. And then when he doesn't know the next thing to do, you call the next guy and he tells you to do this and that. So um, this is pretty typical. Pretty, pretty much everywhere. And of course, the problem is that this doesn't scale. This doesn't scale across the team, it doesn't scale across projects, it just doesn't scale. But it's amazing how many people do this. One of these or all of these things. But very, very commonplace. Here's another one. You've got a lot of tools out there. Uh, specialist tools. So there's like the village engineers got their tools. You've got release people, they got their tools. You've got uh, guys that manage the infrastructure and the servers, they have their tools and so on, right? Everybody's got their tools, but if you look at it from an end-to-end -end release process, you're, you need to coordinate across these tools. That's what makes it hard. So <clears throat> each one of these islands is automated. It's got automation, but the problem is how do you automate across these things? That's, what makes, that's really what makes it hard, and that's what really slows down the delivery cycle. Uh, the delivery cycle is really slowed down because of handoffs. And I know this because I've analyzed it now. I've analyzed it many times formally. Small and big companies, this is the nut of it, is that handing off between all these silos and tools is what makes things hard and slow. And that's just for one team, so stand back. You've got more than one business unit. And this is the truth of uh, any big company, is that you've got islands inside each business unit, and if you're VP of engineering, the CIO, or the product manager, you have to cut through all this stuff. And this is really the complexity of a process. So that brings us to uh, why Rundeck and the project vision. Project vision is really to, first of all, create visibility into all these operational tasks. So how does all these point specialists publish the way they do their job in a way that can be reused, in a visible way, that they can see how it's used, 
and the people who need to run it can see what they're running. So that's one thing. The other one is, and this is a, this is a term straight out of lean thinking, is to turn information flows into what we call artifact flows. That basically means code in our business. And this idea of a job in Run Deck is really an example of code rather than the do this than that kind of documentation. Um, and then, you know, this interface layer uh, that you can build on top of all the tools, you can think of it almost like a middleware or an integration layer, but the idea of an interface that you can put on top of the tools so you can connect them, that's another part of the vision. Um, for managers, they, they're always uh, concerned about who's doing what, when, and where. So you got all these disparate tools, you could build that kind of functionality into each tool, but if you can expose them to this higher level, um, it makes it easier for managers to see what's going on. So that's another part of the vision. And then there's this new idea that, that uh, we've been uh, really thinking a lot about, and that is operations as a service. You know, we need another ass here, right? We've got infrastructure as a service, PAT, platform as a service, we need another ass. So that should be operations as a service. And really what that comes from is, Instead of you taking a request to do something like a mechanical Turk and getting it done, anticipate the kinds of things people want from you and be a service provider. And that's a huge change. That was a huge change for me because I was a tools developer thinking, yeah, problem solved, software. Another problem, another tool. Um, that's not really connecting dots though. So seeing yourself as a ser service provider was uh, was a huge uh, eye-opener for me, and I think part of the vision of Run Deck too. So this operations and service is a, is a key point. If you want to say the umbrella idea of the project, it's that. I th everybody here, well, for a couple of exceptions, knows what, um, what Run Deck is. It's a server. But besides this idea of a service provider, something that, that I, I found uh, pretty cool talking to other users was that Run Deck uh, actually increased trust inside companies. I, I, being a techie, I never really look out for this kind of thing. Trust, and, and I asked what that, how, what do you mean trust? Trust meant that if I'm an app developer and, uh, and I need to turn over some kind of automation to the NOC, how can I do that in a way that I can trust we're gonna do it right? Or vice versa, if I'm in the NOC, how can I trust that I can take on some automation from somebody else and plug it into the way I need to run my business? That's kind of trust, and you get trust through visibility. And the other thing that comes with trust and visibility is freedom. And so freedom comes from the idea of, um, I don't need to ask you anymore to do it for me. By getting this self-serve model, this you know operations as a service idea, that's really what gives freedom. And those three, I didn't put the word freedom in here, but those things kind of took me aback. Like, wow, that's, that's a good idea. That's a reason to, to have a project. And, uh, and it's significant to the business. It's, it's an organizational thing. It makes the work uh, easier to do. Um, and then uh, this last one, meantime a button. We heard this from some users. You know, in the Jenkins dev world, you know, basically that's what you get. Meantime a button is pretty quick. I need to set up a build. Easy, I set up a project. I check in my, put in my source code repo, my build tool. What, 10 minutes, I got a button. So that same idea for ops. What's the meantime a button? And, uh, and more than that, and I would say much more than that actually, is that it should be a user-friendly experience because um, when Ops is delivering this kind of self-serve, they're delivering it to the kind of uh, users that uh, app devs do. They could be project managers, they could be testers, they could be a business guy, I mean, so it's gotta, it's gotta be easy for them. Now, uh, I think Run, Run Deck 1.x had a long way to go on the user-friendly part, but, I thought it was very, uh, very eye-opening for me to hear that the success of an automation developer was how fast they could build the UI in front of their customer, so that there, there was no, there was no back and forth. The back and forth killed the deal. So, if the uh, the guy who needed to push the button said, "You know what? I need this kind of choice, and I need to see this kind of output," if that developer left a day, a week, or two weeks, he might have lost that customer. That customer might have said, well, you know, I'll find, my, I'll find another way. So that mean kind of button is more than just putting the button in place, it's giving the user experience so that in a collaborative, quick cycle way, um, that makes sure you got an adopted, you know, solution. Adoption is the hardest part of automation when you're rolling it out. 
It's not implementing it. It's getting people to use it. So those are, those are big lessons, and uh, those things are all powering the vision of, uh, of Run Deck development right now. Of course, everybody probably knows it's a GitHub project, Apache 2 license. Um, <coughs> the, uh, I just go through a few of these kind of use cases. This first use case was that is one that I was sort of um, alluding to. You know, here's a story where app devs need to come up with some sort of restart procedure, and let's say that the the uh, the ops guys, the admin guys, had their own way of doing it um, by sort of collaborating around this in, a, in terms of a job that was a piece of code. They could then turn it over to the NOC and avoid the the runbook, basically. So this is a pretty common. Maybe this is the most common use case. Is this one? Um, you know, the idea of notification is, is a pretty key point. Um, people need to get notified, so uh, especially when something like a restart happens. Uh, this is another, maybe close second, is zero-click deployment. This is another pretty common use case in, in Rundeck. Um, you know, somebody checks in whatever project they have and whatever CI tool they have. Um, it does a build, it publishes something in an artifact repo, maybe it doesn't publish it in a repo per se, but it's available in the CI build server, and that triggers a, uh, a deployment or some kind of release process inside Rundeck, and it, it interacts with the things below it. So it could interact with, with uh, something that spins up nodes, and then tools like Puppet Chef, CF Engine, Salt Stack, and whatnot. Um, you know, you, you can see there's a resource model here. This is, like that Zynga story, you know, what is the authoritative source of knowledge about your infrastructure? It's the thing that brings up the infrastructure, and uh, and then node execution. This is another you know plug-in point for Rundeck. Um, you know, there's different ways that you might need to do that, depending on the kind of box you're talking to or the kind of thing you're managing. And again, you know, the whole notification part is another key point there. Um, Data processing seems to be more common. This is kind of an increasing use case now. Uh, big data uh, solutions, so not just bringing up the boxes, but actually managing some of the data uh, processing work itself. Um, in fact, if you look back at runbook automation in the 90s, this is one of the main use cases of it. File transfers, ETLs, all that kind of stuff. So I guess it shouldn't be too surprising, but it's, it's coming up on our radar more now. And this is another one. Um, testers don't need a box. They need a whole software stack. They need to bring up a certain version or branch. And just coordinating all the top to bottom of that, that's, that's a pretty bread and butter example of, uh, of Run Um One of the things that uh, I was mentioning about going from a tool developer to a service developer is, uh, and you guys, uh, at Salesforce are actually a good example of this, is the surprising number of users, I, I can't say for sure, but I wanna say about 40%, this is just sort of a get sort of estimation, don't ever see the Rundeck GUI. It's just a service. And they're using it for uh, different reasons, but um, they're, they're just building their own tool framework on top of it. And there's some examples here of, of uh, different companies that are doing that. But, you know, in the end, there, there's some kind of integrating middleware that ties into Rundeck and other tools. And Rundeck may have some uh, custom plugins in here to talk through their other tools to the stuff, that, what else they're managing, and have their own custom GUIs. Actually, you know, I'm a little self-conscious on the Rundeck 1.0, uh, 1.x GUI. It's pretty, pretty crude. And very impressed with what other people have done on top of the service layer. So uh, I've taken inspiration from it. But... Um, some pretty slick stuff, actually, I've seen uh, that, uh, that wraps uh, Rundeck services. And, um, it says a lot, I, I think, for the Rundeck web API. I mean, it's, it's simple enough to consume, and people are, are treating it like a black box. All right, so demo time. Um, I mentioned kind of in passing the 1.x versus beyond, and hopefully, because of my system crashing, it will cooperate. I want to show you guys 2.0. So this is the very first uh, presentation of 2.0. Um, there was some technical debt that we, we owed on the 1.x code base. Um, basically, we in, uh, upgraded all the uh, software stack below Rundex, so it's now on the newest Grails and the newest Ruby. It can run on the newest Java. 
Um, there's a number of dependencies that have been upgraded. So um, there's a little bit more work to do there, but it's pretty much overhauled under the covers. Um, it does seem faster. We haven't done any benchmarking, real benchmarking yet, but um, not that, that that's the only reason, but um, we are, we're on a good new foot. Um, on the UI, you know, we've got on all the bootstrap theming here. Maybe some of you can recognize it. So uh, hopefully it looks a little bit more professional. Um, for anybody who's gone from the pre 1.6, uh, you'll notice that these tabs are the same. For people who haven't gone on a 1.6, uh, we've changed things a little bit. So we used to have the run tab and the jobs tab and history. Um, we're kind of going through this consolidation stage now. Everybody's pretty much told us universally that if they're looking at the GUI, it's there for jobs. So jobs are the first thing to look at. Um, the other thing is very limited uh, people use ad hoc commands. They, they, went to the, they wanted to go to the run page to look at nodes. And then they go to the nodes page and be one node on there by default, which was the Rundex server. And that was like a big pain for them. Like, what? I thought I had 20 nodes in here, or whatever they had. So we've turned the nodes view into a nodes browser, and and you can uh, you know you can still do this kind of stuff. Um, run your ad hoc commands if you have the right ACL uh, policy. Um, this has become the if you had to pick one page to know what's going on in your world. Um, this is it. You just push auto refresh, and it will it will uh, look out for whatever whatever work is going on. Um, so let's see if everything else is working here. Kind of, I'm not, I'm not, I was going to show you guys a continuous deploy process, but it looks like there's something wrong with, um, with this. So <coughs> I wanted to show a couple of things. So for has anybody seen the 1.6 version? No, one. Are we using 1.6? I think it's yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Last one. Uh, yeah. So we've we've um, tried to make things a little bit more user friendly. In fact, let me show you here. So one of the things I was saying earlier was that the user experience is a really key part. Uh, one of the things that people want to know is I don't know what step this was when this output came out. So um, we're, we're actually going to do much more beyond what you're seeing here. But uh, here's the node and then the step. And the idea is that you know if I'm the end user, I can just flip back and forth like, OK, what's this job supposed to do? It takes does these six steps. And I can come over here and say, OK, there they are. It's one to one. Um, so presentation things like that um, is one thing. The other is. Uh, is there, there's a huge range of how people implement jobs. But for some, they, they do a combination of stuff like this, inline scripts. And, and uh, the pre-1.6 version just had an HTML text area. So this has an ace editor. And you can see that it's, it's easier to see. In fact, I put this demo together um, last day or so. and. It was amazing. I, I got an error. It said error line 10. And I went to that and I was like, oh, line 10. It helped me debug it. So that's that was pretty cool. And and that kind of thinking is, is basically driving um, what you will see eventually. And that is things like, imagine there's an error on one of these steps. You'll be able to click on it and go to that step and see what it is and drill down to that implementation. So we're trying to speed up the, you know, the the bug fix problem um, resolution. And one of the things that we've heard from the, how can I say it, the service providers. So if you're a company that provides an automation service to an end user, their end user will run a job and they're like, hey, it blew up on this. And they have to ask the end user, what are you seeing? And that really becomes our requirement for how we design the UI. Design it in a way that the end user can explain it to the automation engineer easily enough that all the dots connect. So um, we've just sort of scratched the surface with what you're seeing right now. We're going a lot farther than this. But that's kind of the key idea is, is to speed up that communication cycle between the people who create the services
for the uh, for the end users. So the, the third line there, where the top says three stop, there's a yeah. Where's the word stop coming from? Is that the command being executed? That's actually that a job. So um, yeah. So if I if I go over here, I can click on it from here, and that's the definition for for stop. So this this example is a uh, it deploys a Tomcat. Um, a, t a couple of Tomcat instances. Actually, this is a good thing to, to talk about. This is another one of these kind of uh, cool ways of using Rundeck. So when you think about a node in, in Rundeck, you probably think about a host with an operating system on it that you're managing some stuff. But that doesn't stop people from saying, no, a node is anything. And um, this is perf I actually reflecting this, this kind of thinking in this demo. So there's this node here, app one. This is actually a box. And you see these other nodes, app one, Tomcat one, these are actually services on that box. This is a modeling of services on the box. And um, an app one, Tomcat one is really just some instance on, on the app one box. But what this lets people do is, okay, let's say I want to do things just to the Tomcat one instances. So I can say, well, That actually went to app one and app two, but it was um, targeted to a particular user on that node. So uh, not everybody uses users to, to isolate deployments, but I did it in this example because I, I, I talked to people who do it this way. They, they have a box, let's say it's got 16 you know, cores on it, they just load it up with men, you know, many instances, and each of these app uh, have their own users, and they kind of protect uh, each app from each other from the user space and they treat each of those deployments like a node. And they can deploy to that node, they can stop that node, they can get no, uh, metadata about that node, and it's pretty powerful. In fact, that's how this whole demo works. So when I'm deploying um, this simple app uh, to the nodes, I'm really deploying it not to the app one node, it's actually deployed to the services. On each node, there's an app, there's a Tomcat 1 instance and a Tomcat 2 instance. And, um, you know, the deployment uses the metadata here. Catalina base is different on app, on Tomcat 1 than it is on Tomcat 2. It's a pretty simple example. But you can see there there is key information. In fact, the deployment process relies on all this stuff. Um, how do you know if it's healthy? You ask the node for its, uh, its app URL. And um, I've seen some pretty creative stuff with this. Um, like I say, uh, users that that have to uh, deploy more than one thing on a box. This is this is kind of a favorite trick to do. And they can also manage layers of their infrastructure this way. So um, yeah, so Node is, is not necessarily a, a physical box. It can be it can be something kind of like a pseudo node. I don't really know the right way. I call it service oriented, uh, for lack of a better way to, to describe it. All right, how are we doing on today? Uh, what what do you guys think? I mean, for anybody who's used to the old UI, is this a step in the right direction? Is this looking better? It's nice. Looking better. I have a question. Yeah. What about in places where there's restrictions about who can do what? Like developers do certain things, the DevOps people do something else. Does Rendeck implement any kind of access control? Yeah, it does. And I uh, thought I had, let's see if it will work now. Maybe it will work. Okay. Okay, cool. So yeah, I got I got an example just for that question. So I'm logged in as admin. Admin can do anything. I can literally do anything Rundeck lets me do at this admin user has that that access. So I'm gonna log out as as admin and I'm gonna become oh before I log out I should point out a few things. So you see there's a, a play button in front of everything. There's a, oops, pull my back in again. There's an edit button. Um, I can see all the nodes. So take it from me, this admin guy can do everything. Um, so I'll log out of, of that guy and I'll become ops. So first I'll become ops. Um, let's call him knock because ops isn't really the right, right term here, but um, no more edit buttons. Could still run stuff, but I can't change stuff. So let's pretend in the story is uh, 
this is the knock group that are not supposed to change the procedure. This is the work with somebody to change the procedure. And uh, let's log on to that guy. Let's become dev. Okay, so let's say in this story, devs are allowed to check the status of stuff. You know, it's okay to, you know, there's no harm in checking the status. Um, let's just say that, 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 you know, it doesn't hurt anything. So, devs can check in on things, get visibility with the ops is a big thing that I think is important. Um, devs have as much visibility, visibility in production as anybody else because they're deploying, they're writing code that goes there. So, so they can check status, but they can't restart stuff, but they want to see the history. Because let's say the not guys, maybe other people are running the restart. Maybe there's a flaky app that keeps running out of memory. They got to keep restarting it. So um, they're allowed to see the history. So the history for all the jobs is actually displayed, though. If you go back one page, you can see the promotion history as well. Ah, good eyes, yeah. I uh, need to tighten up my ACL. Can you use LDAP? An LDAP environment with this so that you can do your authentication authorization in groups that way? Um, most people do use Active yeah, Directory as LDAP. Yeah. Um, let's see, there's a last one here. Here, okay, here's the last one. Here's Relang. Uh, they're only allowed to run the promote job. So there's a language, um, I'll call it a language uh, for the ACL policy that maps a, uh, a group to a set of resource actions. So resources are things like job, ad hoc command, uh, resource, uh, events. The things that you see in here um, are, are what you can manipulate with the ACL. And um, on the authentication authorization side, there's, there's a few different ways you can do it. Um, LDAP, Active Directory is of course common. Um, there's a PAM module, you can, you can go through PAM. Um, some people write custom, people have written single sign-on because they have a proprietary User directory service. That's that's a plug-in point for Rendec, but um, typically, you know, I, I see Active Directory LDAP as the predominant thing for managing the, the group membership. Any questions? Yeah. How can you achieve the rolling of grid kind of thing for Rendec? want to do a rolling kind of restart or rolling of grid kind of There's various strategies. Um, so I, I didn't really say much about it, but um, there's this notion of tags. So the first thing is that you classify your, your servers into groups, um, and then you know you're basically uh, targeting groups at a time. You know. Yeah, there isn't like um, this is a, this is a roadmap item, but a roadmap item is to do by percentages, for example. Um, there's another uh, dimension to it, which we call ranking. So you can sort inside groups. So there's there's a lot there, but it's not um, like I said, a roadmap item of, of doing it kind of on a percentage basis. Um, there's a plugin uh, system now for all the workflow steps. I don't have an example of that, but that's another uh, way of implementing your own strategy. Uh, you can just basically not use the built-in run deck dispatching logic uh, and just implement your own uh, workflow dispatcher. So, um, but that's not out of the box. So you guys have uh, simulated any distributor systems um, deployment by effect of means, like, for example, home stack or something like that? Hadoop? Yeah. Yeah, that's one of those, uh, I was mentioning the data processing use cases. Um, I think uh, I think Alexa is one of the, uh, they built a uh, uh, Hadoop deployment on Monday, so. I haven't personally done Hadoop deployment with Rundeck, my, uh, you know, as kind of my own project, but yeah, that seems like a growing use case for Rundeck. One last question, maybe it might be a dumb question. So, is it passwordless as well? That's up to you. Um, there's uh, that's probably the easiest way to go. Uh, that's a plugin point. Firstly, I'm going to say that's what we call the Node Executor. Um, out of the box, SSH is is built in. But uh, there's M Collective. There's you'll hear about salt, and that's a plug-in point. You can you can decide how to manage the SSH access. If you don't want to use password lists, there's built-in support for prompting username and password. There's also built-in support for pseudoing beyond that, so you can do multi-hop through through the built-in uh, SSH layer. 
So, uh, but yeah, I mean, the general the general answer there is that's a plug-in point, and there's certain kind of out of the box functionality as far as SSH goes. Where's this node list getting populated from? Um, this one here is uh, is self registration. So when the VM comes up, it phones home to Rundeck and to Rundeck. To it, yeah. These are pretty so trivial examples. Pardon? Go cloud in script or something like that. Like that. Hey, you can call it bootstrap yeah. script. So can, can that integrate with maybe like a non-external system that has all these infrastructure data? Yeah, I mean, normally, uh, I shouldn't say normally, many cases, you know, it's Chef or Puppet that spin up the box, and Rundeck is actually pointing to Chef Server or Puppet Master to get all the information about the nodes. That's a plug-in point. There's like a YAML file you get? There's YAML or XML. There's, that's a plug-in point also, how you format the, the, uh, the we call it the resource model to Rundeck. So this that whole layer is very open-ended, but... Um, you know, it's interesting talking to different users because I'm sort of this of the mindset that it should come from something like, you know, Amazon. There's an Amazon plugin, for example, that will give you all the EC2 nodes. Um, I mentioned RightScale earlier, but uh, there's a surprising number of users, not a majority, but just, you know, a minority that want to maintain the resource model in their source code repo because they're a data center, things don't change as much, and they want to own the model. So um, I was just working with a, with a user last week, and the first thing they did was a you know git clone right on the run deck box, and it pulled in everything. Pulled in all the jobs, pulled in the resource model, and the script to push everything back and forth. And um, I was like, really, you don't want that in a database? And I was like, no, that's not what we want. So how you manage the resource data is, you know, maybe it just depends on, on the kind of work you're doing. But, Runduck does not have its own database, let's say it that way. You know, it's got plug-in points to feed it, but it doesn't have it. That's actually a question you know, for everybody, because we do get some uh, requests from new users, like, hey, where's the, oh, this is great, you got you know, what was called the run tab before, but now you got the nodes tab, where's the plus button to push to add nodes? You know, so there's an API to do it. Why isn't there a button to do it? So I, I'm not quite sure. Um, what the right thing to do is, we may do it just because there's enough requests for it, but um, you know, it has an SDLC ramification. You know. So if you go back and define the job, so yeah. you're editing it, that's, that's, a, that's a sequence. You've got, you've got, you're writing a script effectively and training these jobs together. Could be a script, could be plugins, could be other jobs, yeah. So this list of jobs that you're running in sequence that you're defining here, how's that version? Internally to Rundeck, you mean? Uh, how are the how, how does the workflow system yeah, manage so, it? Or? So this is so so that's the source itself. That, that source itself, right? And it's a, ah, in the database. It's in, it's a sequence of tasks, so it's in the database. Yeah. And that's version. And, uh, skip back and forth. And say, well, the for every the job that you run, you store a copy of the definition that that was the execution. But Rundeck does not version it. So. Um, this has been kind of a philosophical question for me because most, so there's really two kinds of users. There's the one kind of user that are interactive users. They log into run deck and they, you know, poke around and get something working. And then there's what I'll call the service uh, delivery or service provider users. And that's code for them. So it's, you know, they might, they might use run deck interactively to get a definition, but then that's committed to source repo and then they have a release process to, to push it around to Rundeck. So Rundeck has an archive that you can package up a set of jobs and move it around like a, it's, it's a zip basically. Um, and this is the, the correct promotional model. If you've got a bunch of Rundex, you know, you've got a dev and a QA and a prod, you're working through all your mode automation and dev, um, a build artifact is the archive that you can then push into all the other Rundex. So the other Rundex are operational Rundex, People take uh, the interactive editing away from those. They're controlled servers. So versioning in that point is is part of like the software. You know? So um, Runduck database doesn't version uh, it itself. So like you know, WriteScale, they will create a you know, copy basically of the old write script and 
call it, you know, version next, whatever the uh, version was. So, uh, no, um, it's a, yeah, it's, it sometimes comes up, but uh, I think the typical answer right here is they're using SDLC when that becomes an issue. Um, but this actually brings me up to a, another roadmap point. Um, which is job libraries. So I'd say the majority of users have a, a some set of, uh, of generic solutions. I've heard all kinds. And they build other jobs on top of them. And uh, <clears throat> right now, they have to load these generic jobs into each project that needs them. This kind of sucks, because you're basically duplicating it. It's not much of a maintenance problem because they have this automated way of loading them, but it just kind of smells bad. So, um, so one of the things that we're doing in 2.0 is to have this idea of a job library and version libraries. And so we've been talking to some of you that, that want to work in this way. And what they really are asking for is, I've got app stack major version X and app stack major version Y, or call them processes, it doesn't really matter. And um, they want to write a job that selects what version of that overall automation code set they want to use. So, um, so what they really want to do is they want to have version libraries of all the automation, and then build jobs on top of those that pick from the versions that they want. So that sounds, that's, I don't know, that's one way we're talking about it. Um, the other thing that we're talking about on these job libraries is, uh, is really to present the jobs in a library like a plugin, because that's essentially how you could look at them too. Um, I don't have an example of a plugin uh, here, but each plugin has its interface. It has inputs in, in it, and it has kind of like what it wants to start, what it's going to do when it's done. And uh, jobs are like that too. So the, uh, these job libraries are kind of like projects with jobs in them, but they're freeze dried. They're read only, and um, and they they should present themselves in a way like the plugin system presents custom job steps. So that's that's another way we're kind of thinking about refining the reusability uh, is is through that. So kind of on the early stage of, of the job library concept. But the other thing that's been a real headache for users is um, good SEM support. Um, you know, you can load jobs in the server, you can dump jobs from the server, but I think a natural uh, workflow is, you know, I'm just pointing my IDE on some files and I'm manipulating them and I just go to the Rundeck thing or I use a command line tool to tell Rundeck to do something about it. And, uh, and just to basically make that workflow seamless. That's probably one of the highest priority things that, that we're going to do for, for 2.0. Um, and then there's there's a number of uh, of APIs that we want to add uh, to uh, to the set that's already there, but mostly um, Rundeck administration. Most uh, most users at scale have multiple instances with many projects, and they need to manage their configuration, manage plugins, uh, jobs, whatnot, everything. And uh, there's some gaps in the in the API that have been filled with some kind of point command line tools, but um, we're going to extend the API set to to really help those kinds of users, and other other um, other plugins also that uh, I just put plus plus there uh, for other examples. So, and then you might have noticed uh, for the we talked about a little earlier that the run DMC thing we we were actually going to pick a logo here, so that's the working logo. I don't know what you guys think about it, but I think it's pretty cool. All right. Um, I think I'm kind of over time, but... Yeah, well, Any other you, questions? Yeah, maybe a couple more minutes yeah. for questions. Do you want to, do you want to, yeah. Alan, do you want to start sure. getting your laptop set up? Mm -hmm. Actually, my, my personal pain point is kind of developing the workflows. It's like you make sure the long workflow is 10 steps, and then something breaks at step five, but there's no way to kind of easy way to jump in and like skip some steps. 
Yeah, break, like kind of break points or yeah, skip over <laughs> continuity. Yeah, it's right. my whole presentation. Yeah, it's just taking points. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's awesome. It would be great. No, yours is a good example. Um, yeah, actually, uh, that, that's, uh, that's another uh, idea that, that we've heard before also, is, um, is to skip and also stop. Like basically insert break points or skip over mm -hmm. steps, you know, it could be that um, you know that certain steps aren't going to work because of environment conditions or who knows what. Right, it'll temporarily right. turn them yeah. Um, yeah, that's definitely on our list. And how, how big is your team? Uh, well, we got uh, two full-time and, and a few part-time on the Rundeck development. And uh, yeah, we're getting... The, the plugin system is pretty new, so we're starting to get more uh, plugin contributions. Do you feel like really you're traction as a as a open source project? Um, well, I'm learning uh, to be better about it. So you know, Rundeck kind of started off as a uh, as a project to I don't know solve some business needs of our of our own. You know, doing consulting, and it, I hate to say it, it was kind of back burner. You know, for the paying the paying gigs. Mm -hmm. um, it was a cool project. You know, we we used it where we could use it. But April was really this this April this past April was is really taking it off the back burner and, and uh, breathing breathing life into it and really starting to treat it like a a regular open source project if you will. So yeah, it's kind of interesting. You know, you put energy into something, you start to see feedback. So um, that's pretty cool. And hearing some of the uh, use cases, you know, big customer uses, and and we're and kind of how they're applying it. So yeah, I think uh, although. It might have started its history a few years ago. Um, you know, I kind of want to say that uh, it sort of got a start, and now we're really, um, you know, we're really going to take it forward. So, positive sign so far. Any other? Uh, I was going to ask Alex, what are you, uh, what are you doing with the rerun, and where do you see rerun and <coughs> run deck interacting with each other, or? That's funny. Does everybody know what rerun is? Um, you know, I have to admit, rerun for me is this fascination project. Uh, it kind of came out of. Well, I don't want to go whole history on the rerun thing, but because it's kind of funny. I mean, if you look at the tool set we use and the way we're using it, use right? If you look at the way we're finding our overall tasks and fabric and what you, there's, there, it kind of almost sits halfway between. No GUI, no ACLs, no any of the other things, but but I've got a procedural language and it's like easy to check it out. Or reruns kind of all the way on the other side. Like what's the easiest possible way to build this yeah. set of things? That's kind of a it's an interesting blend. I think reruns things. biggest problem is me. <laughs> um, it keeps proving itself to me. It keeps me like, how, how could this be a good idea? And it keeps proving itself. Actually, uh, it's funny you say that because um, I was working with some users, Rundeck users, last week, and uh, they said I got all these loose scripts, um, you know, it's flavors, you know, various ones on theme. Uh, have you heard of this rerun thing? And I'm like cracking up, like, yeah, I've heard of it. And what do you think about that? And I'm like, yeah, you could clean up all your scripts with it. And it was supposed to be a five-day Rundeck automate everything. And it turned into two and a half, almost three days of rerun everything. And what they really did was they rationalized all that kind of lower level automation with rerun modules. And then the run deck part was like super clean. It was just building on all these things. And then they were saying, you know what, we want now, we want a plugin system from rerun to run deck. And I did it just to see what it would be like. And uh, so, you know, I don't know why I have this really issue with rerun, but it's like, oh, that's actually pretty good. Um, I don't know, the jury's out. Maybe I'll do a, a demo with it. Uh, with rerun. Yeah, I mean the two, the two together. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe more beer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do people need a, a, you want to take a quick couple minutes? Or can... should we just jump in?